Okay. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. As I said, I'm Duncan Burrell. I'm responsible for a, a group within Side Ford that was set up to address exactly this need. It's a group called the Connected Services and Solutions Organisations, and it's really about how we bring content from outside the vehicle into the vehicle, and how we connect um, the consumer's digital life to their, to their automotive lives. Um, we've got a small group now set up in Germany, and we're setting that group to run globally across the world, so we have a replication of that group in Asia, and obviously a, a big body of that group in North America, where the, the base of Ford is. So today what I hope to take you through is a, a little bit of understanding of what's going on in the automotive industry, why this is a, a challenge for the automotive industry, um, give you an insight into how perhaps to make apps safe and what sort of apps are relevant for the automotive industry, and to talk about what Ford is specifically doing to address this challenge, to give you an insight of how we've looked at those challenges and how we're trying to address those and how working with Ford would be for developers like yourself, which is really why we're kind of here. Okay. So if we start with why is Ford doing this, um, I apologise this slide is a tiny bit old, but everything on it is relevant, and if anything the statistics have just got worse and the need to do this has just got greater. But what you guys will be more than familiar with now is that really mobile usage and mobile internet traffic has now eclipsed the desktop PC, and there's more people looking at internet content and more people having smartphones, etc., than there are people roaming the internet on computers. And just a couple of statistics here, as you can see, there's almost as many phones out there as there are now people in the planet. Um, desktop traffic's been eclipsed by mobile traffic now, sort of two to one almost. And even things like our own websites, we're getting enormous numbers of visitors every sort of quarter, every sort of month. And then on top of that internet um, life, what's happened with the smartphones is an explosion into applications, which is why you guys are all here. And we're seeing customers use applications to do functions and features on smartphones, and they want to bring those applications and those relationships they have with those applications into the automotive vehicle. They're used to using them outside the vehicle, and they want to use them safely inside the vehicle. And that's really the, the challenge we saw and we recognised that we had to address. Okay. Um, so mobile devices, as we said, they're, they're ubiquitous, they're out there, and they're very integrated into people's lives. Okay. So why is this a challenge for the automotive industry? Well, the first and most obvious one is, is really the different pace between the two industries, which I'm sure I don't really have to point out to you, but let's just really highlight how big that difference is, because I think it's sometimes misunderstood how big a challenge that is. So here's a simple example. Let's take the, the current Fiesta, the one you'd perhaps all recognise, which was actually launched in August 2008. That's what we call a Generation 6 Fiesta. And that vehicle was, um, was launched, what now, just over four years ago, is in market, and is going to be in the market beyond 2020. Yeah? Last summer we actually did a facelift to that, so that wasn't what I'd call a complete new vehicle, but it was a, a fairly major facelift. Uh, we did a, a relaunch of that, and we launched that in August. So four years between a whole new model, a facelift, and that facelift now is likely to be in the market beyond 2025. Yeah? And we're also obviously working, as you can imagine, on what comes next, our next major model of the Fiesta. So you can probably guess when we're going to um, launch that, but we haven't publicly announced it, which is why I don't have a date up there. But that next version that we're now engineering in our centre in Cologne is going to be in the marketplace beyond 2030. Now, if you think about the life of a phone, if I asked you what phone you're going to be using in 2030, you'd look at me blankly with absolutely no idea. If I then asked you what apps would be on that phone in 2030, I'd be asking you an even greater challenge with no opportunity. So if we lay that up, and I do apologise here, I've obviously took an example which is it's not actually a, a key for today, but it's perhaps the easiest example to lay it against. Um, I took the iPhone, it's a, a simple phone with a simple history that I can show a, a very great comparison to. So the first iPhone was launched in June 2000. 2007. In 2008, uh, in June, a year later, they launched the 3G, a, a major refit. One year later, they did a facelift. So, equivalent in our terms, we took four years, they did one year. And every year, pretty much, they've done another facelift, and biannually, they've done a, a major product launch in their relation. So, from when we launched the, the Gen 6 Fiesta uh, to when we just did a facelift, the iPhone have effectively gone through three generations and two facelifts of those generations. That's a significant difference in timescales and almost an impossibility for us to match those into the vehicles and predict what's going to come and engineer that into our vehicles. And you can see we can continue to the iPhone. So, in reality, 
Um, an upgrade is an annual process, whereas we're three to four years. A major launch event is perhaps bi-yearly on the phones. I know Samsung and people are even actually pushing that bi-yearly down. We're six to eight years. And the production life of a phone is, is, is one to two years versus probably five years for a vehicle production life. And even longer when you look at extending those vehicle lives into some of the emerging low-cost markets where we will continue platforms for longer and for cheaper costs. So there is a, a massive fundamental difference here between the life cycle of a vehicle and the life cycle of a phone. And I've been at many conferences and people talk about the, um, the automotive OEMs working to, to reduce that gap. In truth, I've been at an automotive OEM now for 20 years. Um, we are working, of course, to make our development time cycle slightly shorter, but we, in principle, will never fundamentally reduce that gap. The investment in making a vehicle, the investment in tooling that's laid down, means that financially you have to build that vehicle for a number of years. The investment of the consumer in the vehicle means that vehicle must have a, a life in the field as well for a number of years. So in reality, it's wrong to believe we will reduce that gap. That gap will always remain. What we can do is do things with technology to minimise the impact of the gap, but we cannot take the gap away and the issue away. Yeah? Okay, so that, that's the first major challenge. The next major challenge for us, very much related to that, is what do you build into the vehicle versus what is brought into the vehicle? Yeah? So if you think of this from the perspective of mobile devices versus embedding systems into the vehicle, you have to think about the hardware, so things like the physical user interfaces, the screens, the buttons, but also the processing. Is the processing built into the vehicle or do you bring a processing power to the vehicle and then upgrade that every year as the processing power outside the vehicle gets better and better, rather than living with the processing power you, you launched the vehicle with maybe 15 years ago? Um, similarly with all the cellular engines and data connections, do you embed a cellular engine in the vehicle today? There's 2G, 3G, knowing that in 2025 probably that's the wrong technology to have embedded in the vehicle. So you have to think very carefully of what is right to put into the vehicle and how do you um, bring devices to the vehicle? Because obviously those interfaces of devices aren't consistent. How do you then mount that device so you could even use it safely and effectively? Consumers want a, a vehicle that has a very slick appearance. The last thing they want is aftermarket devices um, that are bolted to the IP. They want a beautiful clean line. When you're working with a styling guy um, for a vehicle IP, in reality what I think he wants me to do is offer him a solution that's a head-up display that works by ESP because he doesn't want to put a button on the dashboard if he can help it because he wants it to look beautiful and functionality is a long way from the mind of a styling guy sometimes in the automotive world. So it's a real challenge to work out today what is the right split between brought in versus built in and how we manage that split. And it's not just a hardware issue, it's also a software issue. Let's take a function like voice recognition, which is something that Ford is very strong on. Do you do that voice recognition inside the vehicle, or do you do that voice recognition off-board inside the cloud? Does that voice recognition have to be always there, or can you rely on a data connection to provide it? So you also have to think about not just the split, but how is that voice recognition used? Do you need it continuously available? And that applies to applications, it applies to contents like map, music, all those sort of things. You have to think very carefully about what do you put in into the vehicle and what can you bring to the vehicle. And there's a range of influence factors to think about here as well. So things like legislation that may drive you to embed certain bits of technology into the vehicle or may drive you to have certain ways of interfacing with the vehicle. There are things like we just mentioned before, network and data coverage and costs for providing that data coverage. If you need something to be always available like navigation, can you rely on the map being off board and being served to you in real time? Some customers that works for, some customers that doesn't work for. So you have to recognise that not every customer is the same. So you have to think about the vehicle segment and the customer profile, as well as thinking about the market and the region. What's expected of a vehicle in China and from a customer in China is very different from what's expected from a vehicle in Russia, for example. So we have to think very globally. And I think the key thing that comes out of this for an OEM is there isn't actually one single solution. There isn't one answer that is perfect. What we have to develop is a range of flexible platforms, manage our complexity, but address the different needs of different consumers and different customers in different marketplaces. Okay. Okay. So one of the next challenges that you're all very familiar with is then once we've decided what our vehicle architectures look like, once we've decided what our hardware looks like, we then have to decide how much of this is open and how much of this is closed. And this is the question that a lot of the OEMs are going through at the moment. Um, there are obviously advantages to having open solutions and there are obviously advantages to having closed solutions. If you take an open solution, you obviously get a, a great benefit from scale. And you can, with the benefit of scale, you can get a reduced cost. If people have to develop for one system that can go across a, a large number of OEMs and manufacturers, that's a real benefit. When you look at um, 
the volumes of OEMs. It's very small compared to the volumes of smartphones and mobile devices. You know, the European market for vehicles is around about 15 to 17 million. That is a very small market compared to the volumes of smartphones that are actually being sold out there. Each OEM has probably somewhere between an 8 to 10 percent. So again, you're talking one and a half million, two million unit volume for each of the OEMs in that marketplace. Innovation. Um, open systems tend to lead to better innovation than closed systems. The idea that if Ford has a closed system, that Ford will have all of the innovation rather than small startups, thought centres, that is something that's unrealistic. So with an open system, you're much more likely to see innovation come into the system. And similarly, with an open platform, you're likely to offer the consumer much greater choice, much greater opportunity. On the other side, however, though, of course, with a closed system, you have a much greater level of control and the ability to determine exactly how things work and what works with inside your vehicle. And that level of control does lead to what I would call a better level of perceived quality to the consumer at the end of the day. You can ensure that the system always works and is guaranteed to work. And that's a very different expectation of a, a vehicle consumer sometimes, I think, to a, a leading edge technology consumer. In the vehicle, you expect all the features to work all the time, first time. Someone who's on the leading edge of technology recognises they're on the leading edge of technology and is much more accepting to there being complexities and difficulties and those situations not always working. And I think that's something that vehicle OEMs are very uncomfortable about giving away. They're expected to have a high level of quality and they'd want to maintain that very high level of quality. Similarly though, if you're doing safety inside a vehicle, there's many functionality that's related to safety and there's a lot of responsibility on an OEM for safety. So bringing in these advanced features with no control on them is of great worry for OEMs. What would it mean if you have an open system, someone writing to the displays in the vehicle with no control of the OEM? What would the impact of legislation be if we really did open up the vehicle interfaces to allow any content with no control from the manufacturer into the vehicle? And similarly, I think you get a, a, a better consumer experience if you have a level of control. You enable consistency across that experience because it's, it's got a, a central point and, and that consumer experience is, is of significant value. In summary though, however, when you look at all of these two sides of the arguments, what, what I come to is um, I don't come to an OEM being able to say they're going to have an open or a closed system. I think in reality an OEM will have to offer an open system for certain aspects, for certain features. And that's going to be some of the, the very consumer-led and the very consumer-focused features that are not what I would call very very automotive specific. So news content, music content. The last thing... Um, a customer wants is me telling him you should get music in this way because that's what Ford says. When he sits at home and has music listened to in a different way, he just sees the vehicle as an extension of his life where he listens to music and he listens to music in his lounge, on the train, on the tram and in the vehicle and he wants a consistent experience. So he doesn't want to be dictated down a closed ecosystem by an OEM. But vice versa, when I look at um, a system for maybe doing a safety critical feature or a vehicle advanced feature that really is very closely related to the vehicle ownership experience, Experience, then I think there is a need to have a closed ecosystem, manage that and make sure it fits with the brand elements of the OEM. So I, I really don't believe it's a, a choice between the two. I think OEMs will end up offering both open and closed systems and it's again what is open and what is closed that's the decision for the OEM. Okay, so what do people actually want to do inside cars? Um, I apologise, it's a little bit difficult to read, but um, this is a, a European market research um, survey done by the Customer Insight people. The reality is the North American one is almost identical. What you really see here from the consumers, and I think you have to take this with a pinch of salt as well, if you ask consumers 20 years ago, did they want Facebook, they'd tell you no, they didn't. So this is what they tell you they want today, and not a big surprise, the sort of things they tell you they want to do inside a car are features and functions related to the auto automotive vehicle and related to the driving experience. Things like Facebook and Twitter come down actually very low at this point in time. Um, so you're seeing content that adds value to vehicle driving and then you're seeing entertainment content. So news, music, the sort of things that really expand what they're doing today, move from the traditional sort of broadcast radio into more of a personalised service of entertainment while they're driving. Um, so now if you're developing apps for the vehicle though, what do you need to bear in mind? What are the critical elements for de developing apps? Because it is a different environment to developing an app for someone to use on a smartphone when they can put more attention to it. The most important thing is, is really to ensure whatever user interface you have is very, very simple. Um, 
It's better to do less features well than to offer consumers a whole raft of functionality that's sometimes offered under um, software platforms and configuration platforms outside of the OEM. Offering those features have very low value inside a vehicle. What you want to offer, understand from people is, what do they actually want to do inside the vehicle and how can you make sure what they want to do is beautifully simple and easy for them to achieve. So I'd say simplicity of the user interface is probably key to making a vehicle app work well and making it have good penetration and good usage with the customers. Um, bear in mind, most, as I said, most vehicle owners are not necessarily technology first-time adopters. These are followers and if something doesn't work for them, the first time, the second time, reliably, then they won't pick it up and they won't use it again. So I'd say making it simple, making it easy to use is probably the key to having a successful app inside a vehicle. Um, you have to remember to always leave the driver in control as well. The primary task of the user in the vehicle is to drive the vehicle. The app is a secondary task. And the critical thing there is to make sure that no task they're doing within the app is time critical. You don't want to say you need to do something at this point in time if the guy is driving, maneuvering, or doing any other operation inside the vehicle. You want to make sure the app is built in a way and that the requirements of the app are built in a way that the user can address that as they can and as they have the cognitive load reduced in the driving experience to actually address the task. So be very careful to make sure there's no sort of time critical tasks. Um, the other thing is to really put a limited number of steps to complete any tasks. So don't build long nested tasks that require a large number of operations. Make sure any task can be completed with one, two simple operations relatively quickly and don't require multiple steps and multiple tasks. So quick action menus, shortcut commands, single voice commands, those sort of things. Make sure um, any task is concluded quickly and also make sure any task is, I'd say, um, maintain a logic of operation. In a vehicle, that means, for example, if you start a task on the center stack, pressing center stack buttons, you need to be able to conclude it there. You don't want to do a task that requires two voice commands and to press a button, or requires you to press a button on the steering wheel, and then you have to finish the task pressing a button on the center stack. You want to make sure the, the actual interface and the way you communicate with the task is consistent and is always done in a single way. Yeah? So I think the, the, the final tag we always say, less is more inside the automotive vehicle. Less features, well done, interface to really successfully is better than offering the customers a whole range of options that are of low value, that seem practical when you're on a desktop or you seem to offer great choice to the consumer, but actually that choice is confusing and actually more difficult to work your way through in a vehicle environment. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what Ford is now doing to address some of those challenges we talked about. Um, in terms of a platform, we have a single global platform for our vehicles, which is called Sync. And Sync is our way of bringing devices to the vehicle and interfacing those devices into vehicles in a seamless experience. And we offer Sync in a, in a range of different levels across the globe. Um, and it is a truly global product now. It's took us a few years to, to achieve that, but we've gone from having different strategies across different marketplaces to now having one platform that we launch globally that we are now developing and bringing global. And the key thing that we rely on for Sync is we're really pushing very heavily on voice activation. So this concept of hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, is, is really how we're pushing the HMI solutions that we offer for our, for our vehicles. So it's bring your mobile device, bring your iPod, but get access to the content on that device using simple voice commands. Okay, so Sync is a product. As I said, it's a global product. It's launched in North America, Europe, and the APA regions. We've got over 4 million vehicles already now equipped with Sync. Um, we're supporting 19 languages, including languages like Mandarin, and we're looking to grow those. Here in Europe, we launched um, Sync last year. We're looking at having 3.5 million Sync equipped ve vehicles by 2015. And in that time frame, there'll be 14 million Sync equipped vehicles uh, globally, which I know in the, the non-automotive world of smartphones sounds like a small number. Number, but in the worlds of a uh, automotive, uh, that's a, a very large number for a consistent single platform. Okay, but Sync is um, is a platform that we're building on, and we add features to. And, and the key feature that was really why we came here to DroidCon to talk about is uh, is a product called AppLink. And AppLink is really about how you can get applications on smartphones to actually work with our in-vehicle platform and can control those applications in the vehicle. So it's effectively, as it says here, a little bit of software in the vehicle and a bit of software on the smartphone. 
And what it allows the application to do effectively is use the vehicle resources. So in that way, it allows the app to use the vehicle audio system and the vehicle microphone. So you can have a seamless experience in terms of making sure any music content playing at that time is paused while you're giving instructions or applying voice commands. Um, it allows the application to access the, the vehicle HMI through the steering wheel buttons or the multimedia buttons so that you can actually subscribe to buttons, have control. In this example, we're showing a simple weather app where the normal sort of touchscreen buttons on the phone get replicated into the touchscreen or the soft keys on the actual audio system. And then finally, we can write to the displays of the vehicles as well. So we can provide content from the application into the vehicle displays. And we're looking at extending those APIs to provide more capabilities. And then we have one fourth element to develop some specific vehicle content in the future is we're going to access vehicle data via the AppLink API. So pass things like the GPS information that's dead reckoned from the vehicle into a phone, allowing you to have a quality of GPS information that you potentially can't get when you've got a phone that's mounted in the center of the vehicle no sight of sky, pass the information like the ODO, and we'll extend that API and add greater information into that API over the years effectively. So that's what AppLink is as a technology. Uh, just very briefly, um, I'll give you a very quick example of, of how it works. You can listen to someone other than me. Technology for a living, but even I was surprised when I found out one of the first integrated car radios was in a Ford. Of course, people still love entertainment in their car, but things have changed a little since then. Consider something Ford calls Sync AppLink. It literally links certain apps on your phone so you can control apps by speaking into a microphone. All while your phone is, say, in your pocket. Mobile apps, please say a command. Pandora. Now it's playing Pandora through the app on my phone and through Sync AppLink. Now if I like the song, I don't have to press a button on the phone. Pandora, please say a command. Thumbs up. Sync AppLink puts you in the driver's seat. And pretty soon, the same is going to be true as more apps are added and downloaded to your phone. You're going to be able to access them just by speaking. It's truly cool. You say it, Sync listens and responds to you while you drive. OK, I hope that's uh, slightly better than me talking to it to actually see it working. You're more than welcome to come and see how it works on the stands later today as well, of course. Um, so what are we doing to support AppLink? Because clearly having the technology is only really the first step. The most important thing is making the technology accessible to people, making it open and making sure that we can get interesting people working within the environment. What we've done is we launched at um, CES this year the, the first sort of automotive developer program. So we, we copied the model that we know developers would, would be used to. So we looked at how other people like Facebook, like Motorola and people had done their developers programs and we launched a very similar concept, a developer program to how to get hold of the Ford AppLink SDK and then how to integrate that into your application. So it provides all the usual sort of open access to the SDK. You simply register and can get hold of the, of the SDK for Android, iOS and also for BlackBerry. It offers Q&As, quick guides and all the sort of useful resources that you would expect to find under a developer site and we will continue to, to grow that and add content into that uh, development site. We're also in the program offering tools to test and validate applications. So we have a product called a TDK, which is a, a test development kit. And to support that, we've now recently added to the website an emulator, so people can start off with a level of software emulation, test their applications with software, then they can subscribe to do it with a physical test using our test development kits. So there's exclusive tools and there's um, development tools that are really needed to test applications and make sure they're robust before they're submitted to the application stores. We we offer hints and tips on how to achieve many of the, the functionality, so there's segments of code in there for how to do the common features. So one of the things we'd, we're very keen to do with all of the applications that run with AppLink is to lock out the smartphone. So as you launch the application, the idea is you no longer interface with the, the phone while you're driving the vehicle because the phone interface has really been designed for someone sitting on a chair, staring comfortably at the phone, using very small keys, very small little icons on the phone, often very small, difficult gestures. So we do lock out the phone and provide a lockout phone, and then the functionality comes through the sync system, through the buttons that are designed to be used in the vehicle, and through the voice system that's also designed to be used in the vehicle. But there's step-by-step -step guidance of how to achieve those things. 
And then finally, there's, a, there's a, obviously help at hand. So there's the usual sort of forums, blogs, and ability to submit questions directly through to our, expert, our experts. And our experts, of course, globally now in this world. So we can answer those questions from people in Asia region, from in the North American region, and of course here in Europe as well. So support is there and available through the development side. The other challenge we recognize for, for apps is this issue of discoverability. The, the Ford system with handling apps is, is very different to some of the, the other systems. We don't intend to curate and have our own content. Our vision here is that consumers are used to handling apps, that they know apps, they know how to get those apps, they know how to maintain and update those apps, and they're familiar with the various stores that are out there. So they don't really want Ford to develop another store. I don't think there's a need for a Ford app store. But we do recognize that finding apps in the crowded marketplace is extremely difficult. And if we launch AppLink, finding apps that have AppLink capability in that crowded marketplace will be even more difficult. So what we've developed and what we will launch later this year is a product called an app catalog. And the idea with the app catalog is it will allow us to guide our consumers and guide our users through to the apps that have AppLink. And it will allow us then to promote various features and various apps. So, it's a, so you can see it is. It's a created tool for allowing people to find apps that are relevant. And the experience we're going to offer through that app store, through that catalog, is obviously the sort of familiar experience of the front page, um, some sort of banners, the ability to feature apps and promote apps, of course. Um, we'll then obviously allow people to do not just vehicle-specific categories and look for apps under types and categories, but we'll also be able to offer people apps in terms of marketplaces and regions, because obviously the apps that work in China are very different to the apps that work in Europe. And even in Europe, you've got a Russian market, the Turkish market. They're very different to the apps that work in, say, Germany or the UK. So again, this will allow us to, to guide people to the apps that are AppLink enabled, but AppLink enabled and relevant for categories and relevant for their marketplace that they're in. Um, it will also allow us to provide a complete listing so they can find all of the apps, provide the usual sort of ratings of those applications, and how they work. So a guide of what the voice commands are, what the vehicle experience looks like, how you can use that app in the vehicle. So that's the other key element of the, of the catalog app to help people using those apps. And then finally, content pages for the apps. But as we mentioned, the, the key thing here is when it comes to getting the app and when it comes to downloading the app, that's going to be done through the traditional app stores, through Google Play, through the iPhone store. We don't intend to actually have our own billing system. We don't intend this idea of it's a Ford app store. That, that isn't our philosophy. And that has a real strength. Um, the strength of that, for example, is if you already have an app that then becomes AppLink enabled, as you go through the normal update process, AppLink just happens to be in your app seamlessly. You didn't have to go away, find that application, download a new variant. You don't have to manage different variants of a Ford version of the app and a non-Ford version of the app. We're very keen to make sure that the AppLink API is embedded in the base application and is always there and doesn't make your life more complicated as the app developers and doesn't make the consumer's life more complicated in having to manage multiple ecosystems. Okay, and the other thing we've been keen to do with AppLink is we recognize for developers that what we really need to do with AppLink is drive it more as an open standard. So what we've done recently is work with a, an organization called Geneva, which may not be too familiar with people here, but Geneva is, a, is an open alliance for developing open source code for in-vehicle entertainment systems. So we've took AppLink, took the source code of AppLink and put it into the Geneva Alliance. So AppLink could be used on more than just Ford vehicles, it could be used on a tier one OEM, um, multimedia generators, people in the GV lines, and it can also be used by other OEMs. Uh, it's going to be called Smartphone Link. Um, it's been offered under the BSD open source license, so there's no fee, there's no license cost. We're not trying to, to license this technology from Ford and make money from it. What we're trying to do is offer our consumers uh, a great app experience and uh, a great ecosystem that makes them attracted to our vehicles. We're, we're not into, as we said at the very beginning, we're not into this apps as a, as a revenue stream for Ford Motor Company. We're into apps as a, a way of enriching our lives of our consumers and making them have an experience and making it safer because what we see is our consumers driving down the road using apps on their smartphones while driving. So we're recognizing that's what's happening and we're recognizing what we need to do is make this um, safer and easier to use. So people like Lustsoft and Telenav have already openly agreed to submit some of their intellectual property, some of their open source code into the, the smartphone link as well. Okay.
Um, just to give you an idea of where we are, we have around about 60 app partners already um, globally. Um, we're really at events like this trying to promote what we're doing, trying to promote the AppLink API both to other OEMs, other um, hardware manufacturers and to software developers to try and encourage people to build the ecosystem and grow the ecosystem and help us drive AppLink as a standard. Um, as you can see here, it's not just about music. There's the weather, there's news, there's vehicle information, um, even a dating app on there and, and, and some very strange things we've launched with AppLink. So it really is just a way to get to the vehicle HMI, the vehicle resources, in a safe way in the vehicle and decouple the app development from the vehicle development. That's really what it enables us to do. Um, to give you an idea of the, the timeline for this, most of these app companies develop apps that work with AppLink in a matter of week and launch them within a matter of months. It, it's a very quick process. And of course what that means for us is, as was mentioned at the beginning, you can launch a vehicle and you can have 10 apps, but while you're maintaining and owning that vehicle, the number of apps that become available to you grows and the number of features and functions enable you to grow. Traditionally when you bought a vehicle, you bought it with a radio in and it's lived with a radio in, or you bought it with a CD in when CDs were launched and all you had was a CD. Through this sort of ecosystem, you can buy the vehicle, and as you own the vehicle, the experience can grow and mature and develop. Okay. And that was everything I had to say. Thank you. Thank you.